when the U.S. Ethiopia engineer UN sanctioned Eritrea on the shore of the Red Sea. Eritrea was colonized by Italy in the late 1880s. In 1935, Mussolini used Eritrea as a base when his troops marched on Ethiopia to the south. Ethiopia fell to Italy, uniting Ethiopia and Eritrea for the first time. In 1941, British troops defeated the Italians and reinstalled Haile Selassie on the throne of Ethiopia. But no freedom was given to Eritrea, which remained under the control of the British. At the end of the Second World War, the United Nations started talking about what was to be done with Italy's former colonies in Africa. In 1952, the United Nations decided that Eritrea should be joined to Ethiopia in a federation although Eritrea would be allowed to keep its own flag, its own parliament, and its own judicial system. The United States supported Haile Selassie and wanted to make use of Eritrea's strategic location on the Red Sea. So, the United Nations voted for the federation scheme. In 1962, Haile Selassie unilaterally decreed Eritrea a province of Ethiopia. This against the will of the United Nations. The United States used Eritrea for its own military purposes. Outside Asmara, the Eritrean capital, the Americans built a Kagyu communications base. This base played quite an important role during the Seven Day War in the Middle East in 1967 and during the Vietnam War. In 1974, Ali Selassie was overthrown and a military regime called the Derg took over Ethiopia. The Derg led by Mengistu Haile Mariam, has continued Haile Selassie's policies towards Eritrea, although now with military support from the Soviet Union and Cuba. The United States continues to pursue a relentless policy of unprovoked hostility against Eritrea. While the isolated manifestations of this unwarranted policy are readily recognized, the underlying reasons behind this policy, its continuity for the past 80 years, as well as its actual dynamics, have not been exposed in much detail and remain blurred. The instances of U.S. adversarial positions recounted in some chronological order in the report accentuate one central narrative, that U.S. hostility towards Eritrea does not emanate from incompatible values in regard to justice, democracy, human rights, or fundamental principles of international law. The profound antipathy that characterizes United States-Eritrean ties does not emanate, as is often insinuated, from recent differences on the war in Somalia. It predates this singular event. Indeed, since the 1950s when overriding U.S. strategic interests compromised Eritrea's right of decolonization, successive U.S. administrations have invariably propped up Ethiopian colonial presence in Eritrea. The instances of U.S. adversarial positions recounted in some chronological order in the report accentuate one central narrative that U.S. hostility towards Eritrea does not emanate from incompatible values in regard to justice, democracy, human rights, or fundamental principles of international law. U.S.'s principal responsibility in stifling Eritrea's right of decolonization in the 1950s to promote its global strategic interests with the advent of the Cold War, its huge military support, including the training of local counterinsurgency forces to the imperial Haile Selassie regime, its less prominent support to the Mengistu regime, in spite of its undeniable alliance with the Soviet Union, and its opposition until the 11th hour to Eritrea's legitimate struggle for liberation are indeed matters of indisputable historical record. After the Italian defeat in World War II in April 1941, the British seemed bent on destroying Eritrea both as a political and economic entity. For instance, in August of 1944, Stephen H. Longrig wrote, The middle and highland part of Eritrea, with its Tigunya-speaking inhabitants, should be united with Ethiopia and receive British aid and support. The people of the lowlands would probably be happy and grateful to be joined with the people of the Sudan. The 
The following statement in John Swankara's book underscores the strategic importance of Eritrea to the United States during World War II and illustrates the British and U.S. collusion with regard to Eritrea. Churchill asked Roosevelt for some help. Roosevelt responded by authorizing a secret mission to build an air depot to be established and operated by American civilians under the direction of Douglas Aircraft Company. It was classified secret and given the title of Project 19. Its location was 1,100 miles from the front lines in remote Eritrea, East Africa. The collusion between the United States administration and the military industrial complex in the Eritrean case is further illustrated by a letter to the Secretary of State James F. Burns from Henry F. Sinclair. Dear Mr. Secretary, my company has only recently completed an agreement with the Imperial Ethiopian government for the development of petroleum in Ethiopia. I feel rather certain that you personally have been informed with a request to this agreement. Unfortunately, the country of Ethiopia is an island country with no direct water outlet for export shipping. Should we be successful in discovering oil, we would of necessity be required to construct adequate pipeline facilities from Ethiopia to a suitable seaport, as well as an export shipping terminal. If we are to proceed with our development program in Ethiopia, it is of vital importance that Eritrea should be recognized as an integral part of Ethiopia, as we would have a suitable seaport outlet. Our entire development program will seriously be delayed and affected should Eritrea be under the domination of any other power except Ethiopia. I therefore urgently request that your good offices support the demand of Ethiopia with respect to Eritrea. With the knowledge and full support of the U.S. administration, the foreign ministers of the U.K. and Italy, Ernest Bevan and Count Carlos Sforza, respectively introduced the Bevan Sforza Plan to the U.N. General Assembly on May 10, 1949. The real intent of the American-inspired plan was to try to wipe Eritrea off the face of the earth in order to safeguard U.S. political, economic, and diplomatic interests against the Soviet threat. The statement by the Secretary of State Affairs to the British Cabinet on the 18th of April 1946 illustrates the, quote, rationale for the infamous plan, claiming Eritrea is ethnically disunited and economically non-viable. There is no good reason for preserving it as an administrative unit under any form of administration, whether under individual trusteeship or restored Italian rule. The right solution would seem to dismember it along natural lines of cleavage. A study conducted by the ICJ, a non-governmental organization dedicated to advancing understanding and promoting the observance of the rule of law and the legal protection of human rights globally, determined that the United Nations had undermined the rights of the people of Eritrea. The ICJ also concluded that it was pressure from the United States, under the direction of John F. Dulles, that deliberately undermined the rights of the Eritrean people. On December 2, 1950, the UN General Assembly adopted Resolution 390A, which proposed that Eritrea be con constituted as an autonomous unit to be federated with Ethiopia under the sovereignty of the Ethiopian crown. In 1952, John F. Dulles, the U.S. Secretary of State, made the following infamous statement to the UNSC. From the point of view of justice, the opinion of the Eritrean people must receive consideration. Nevertheless, the strategic interests of the United States in the Red Sea Basin and considerations of security and world peace make it necessary that the country has to be linked with our ally, Ethiopia. The ICJ concluded that the language in this statement illustrates that the U.S. orchestrated a solution where the U.N. clearly ignored the wishes expressed by the Eritrean people. To further secure its influence in the region, the U.S. signed the Mutual Defense Treaty with Ethiopia on May 22, 1953. Ethiopia obtained massive military assistance and thus eventually became the strongest army in Black Africa. The treaty allowed the U.S. to establish the Kagnu Station in Asmara and satellite military installations in Masawa and Karen.
For over three decades, they played a key role in the U.S. international military intelligence. In November 1962, the federal arrangement was unilaterally abrogated by Haile Selassie and Eritrea was forcibly annexed to Ethiopia. John Spencer, the American advisor to the Imperial Crown, orchestrated the move against the express wishes of the Eritrean people. At a London Peace Conference on May 27, 1991, the U.S. Assistant Secretary for African Affairs, Ambassador Herman Cohen, proposed a coalition government among the EPLF, TPLF, and the Derg. The EPLF had already liberated the entire country by that time, and the Secretary General of the EPLF, Isaiah Saforki, had declared Eritrea a de facto independent state. So, the failed U.S. ruse was to, once again, deprive Eritreans of their well-deserved right for self-determination. When Ethiopia declared war against Eritrea on 14 May 1998, and as Ethiopian jet fighters attacked Eritrea's capital, Asmara, on 5 June 1998, the then U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Africa broke diplomatic precedents to directly address the OAU summit in Ouagadougou in support of Ethiopia and to lobby the OAU to adopt a resolution against Eritrea. The U.S. also extended both directly and mostly through convenient proxies military support to Ethiopia during the war. Although the government of Eritrea has not to date disclosed fully the information at its disposal, U.S. intelligence agencies were further embroiled at the height of Ethiopia's third offensive in May 2000 and instigating acts of sedition and treason. Since 2001, Eritrean diplomats in Washington were denied of their diplomatic privileges on tax exemption in contravention of the provisions of the 1961 Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. Eritrea did not take reciprocal action and U.S. diplomats continued to enjoy their tax exemption privileges. Bolton, whose consent for the United Nations is only matched by his exasperation with the State Department, recounts the position Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Jendai Fraser, adopted in 2006 towards the final and binding ruling an international commission had reached over the Eritrean-Ethiopian border, the cause of a war that claimed some 90,000 lives. For reasons I never understood, writes Bolton. Fraser reversed course and asked in early February to reopen the 2002 Eritrea-Ethiopia Boundary Commission decision, which she had concluded was wrong, and award a major piece of disputed territory to Ethiopia. I was at a loss how to explain that to the Secretary Council, so I didn't. In June 2003, Eritrea was omitted from the list of East African countries slated to receive U.S. funding for counterterrorism, barely three months after its inclusion, and while at the same time retaining Eritrea's membership in the Coalition of the Willing. 
In October 2003, a visiting military team of the U.S. Task Force based in Djibouti assisted the unlawful departure of an Eritrean citizen to Djibouti aboard its helicopter in violation of the domestic laws of the country. In 2003, the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom published its annual Religious Freedom Report accusing the government of Eritrea for violation of religious freedom. In February 2004, the U.S. administration designated Eritrea as a country of particular concern and imposed sanctions on military sales. In December 2003, President Bush announced the cancellation of Eritrea's membership to AGOA barely two years after its inclusion. In January 2006, the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State visited the occupied Eritrean town of Badme through Ethiopia and without the knowledge and authorization of Eritrea. In doing so, Ms. Fraser not only sanctioned Ethiopia's occupation of a sovereign Eritrean town, but to add insult to injury, she proposed that a referendum be held to decide the future of Badme. In November 2006, the U.S. Ambassador to Eritrea demanded that the Ministry of Labor and Human Welfare pay 4.5 million U.S. dollars for food aid donated to the needy by two NGOs, Mercy Corps and Catholic Relief Services, and that was utilized in accordance with the food modernization policy. Similarly, the U.S. administration had previously demanded that Eritrea pay for food aid destined to Ethiopia and that perished in the port of Asab in 1998 with the regime in Addis Ababa declared war and boycotted the port. WikiLeaks exposes that sanctions imposed against Eritrea are politically motivated to divert the attention from Ethiopia's occupation of sovereign Eritrean territory, including the town of Badame. The sanction was imposed on December 23, 2009, but the concerted and coordinated disinformation campaign started in 2006 way before the Somalia and Eritrea and Djibouti issues were taken as an agenda item by the UN Security Council. On Ethiopia's 2006 request to the US government to pressure Djibouti to sever its relationship with Eritrea and urge it to support Ethiopia's agenda. Meeting of US De Deputy Assistant Secretary of Africa, Donald Yamoto with Mr. Tehede Alamu, Ethiopia's Deputy Foreign Minister Addis Ababa on September 16, 2006. The government of Djibouti's opposition to the IGAD actions in Somalia are the result of its fear of Eritrean President Isaias. Tehera said, as well as the President Goulet's personal business interests with Eritrea, Tehera maintained that the GOD was on the wrong path and added that Djibouti was not strong enough to take Ethiopia's continued friendship and forbearance for granted. Tehera urged that the USG speak frankly with Djibouti and its role in the region. He said that President Goule would pay attention to the US concerns given the importance to him of the US military base in Djibouti. He must be told to choose whose side he wanted to take. On US officials active and leading role on imposing sanctions against Eritrea and their attempt to diplomatically isolate it. Meeting between US Deputy Assistant Secretary of State Carl Wyckoff and Prime Minister Mela Zinali in Addis Ababa in November 19, 2009. Wyckoff agreed that Eritrea had shown no signs of changing its behavior, but suggested that broadening the discussions of sanctions, including ambassadors, Ambassador Rice's personal involvement as US-UN, has caught the attention of Eritrean President Isaias. Wyckoff added to the USG, has worked to undercut support for Eritrea, including his own visits to the Gulf countries to enlist their support in such activities. Meeting with Ambassador Rice and French Foreign Minister Kuchner in um, New York, December 7, 2009. Ambassador Rice urged Kuchner to support U.S. efforts to impose Security Council sanctions on Eritrea, on Eritrean officials who are undermining the Djibouti Agreement and giving active support to the Al Shabaab terrorist groups in Somalia. In July 2006, Eritrea's new ambassador to the U.S. was warned that he will have a hard time during his tenure in Washington during a courtesy call to the U.S. Undersecretary of Political Affairs. Glenn continues to describe how the recolonization of Africa is well underway through AFRICOM, the U.S. Africa Command. He talked about how AFRICOM has devised an ingenious way of penetrating the sovereignty of African countries by establishing military-to-military -military relationships. 
These relationships are used to keep the leadership of these countries in check, and at the same time to give an African face to hegemonic wars in the continent. In June 2009, President Obama signed Executive Order 1349, putting Eritrea in the League of Human Trafficking Nations and imposing a series of financial sanctions against it. In reality, it was the U.S. administrations that were willfully engaging in inducing human fight from Eritrea for reasons better known to them. This is in Obama's 2012 speech. I recently renewed sanctions on some of the worst abusers, including North Korea and Eritrea. We're partnering with groups that help women and children escape from the grip of their abusers. We're helping other countries step up their own efforts, and we're seeing results. In 2004, the U.S. government employed the services of the UNHCR to encourage the entire Kanama language group in Eritrea to seek and obtain asylum in the United States. Again in February 2009, the Bureau of Refugees in the State Department announced that it has allocated asylum rights for 10,000 Eritrean youth who may desert the National Service. This act, in fact, violates the U.S. laws against army deserters, as well as undermining the elaborate extradition proceedings that the Pentagon routinely resorts to so as to bring to the court U.S. army deserters from Iraq, Afghanistan, and other war zones who seek asylum in their rural countries. When the U.S., Ethiopia, and Geneva U.N. sanctioned resolutions were adopted by the Security Council, it was done using similar underhanded shenanigans. The U.S. claimed that it was an African initiative. It was not. African states on the U.N. Security Council and IGAD members such as Djibouti, Ethiopia, Somalia, and Somalia served as the African faces for the U.S. agendas against the state of Eritrea. In July 2012, the U.S. and Ethiopia employed similar tactics to pass another unjust, unwarranted resolution against the state of Eritrea. This time, it was at the U.N. Human Rights Council, in which Ethiopia was a member of the council. Once again, Djibouti, Somalia, and Nigeria served as the African faces. The following cable from the U.S. Ambassador to Eritrea shows the intention of the U.S. officials to train Eritrea of its educated young people. Posts plans to restart visa services, completely suspended 2007, for student visa applicants. We intend to give opportunities to study in the United States to those who oppose the regime as well as others. Thus, Post requests that CA seek to establish a limited category, specific extensions to the passport requirement for Eritreans found eligible for student visas. Ambassador Ronald K. McMullen, Tuesday, May 5, 2009. The U.S. administration acted unlawfully to obstruct the demarcation of the boundary in accordance with the final, the final and binding decisions of the Eritrea Ethiopia Boundary Commission (EEBC). When Ethiopia's Prime Minister rejected in September 2003 the EEBC award as illegal, irresponsible, and unjust, and requested the UN Security Council to create an alternative mechanism, this was done in consultation and the approval of the U.S. administration. The appointment of Lloyd Axworthy and the subsequent decisions of the U.S. government to appoint General Fulford are, among other things, clear testimonies to the collusion between the United States and Ethiopia to alter the colonial boundary by circumventing the EEC, the EEBC. U.S. role in exacerbating the conflict with Djibouti. The United States and Ethiopia colluded to nudge Djibouti to fabricate a border dispute and falsely accuse Eritrea for military aggression against its small neighbor. Indeed, djibouti eritrea relations were improving steadily even as the situation in Somalia was taking a turn for the worse in 2006. On September 16, 2006, cable titled, Ethiopia Deputy Minister Tekeda Talk Somalia, Regional Issues with Das Yamamoto, the Ethiopian De Deputy Minister Tekeda Alamu tells a U.S. official in Addis that he wanted a break in Djibouti Eritrea ties. The cable from U.S. Ambassador Donald Yamamoto begins with this. The Eda expressed concern about increasing Eritrean influence over Djibouti as well as CIC contacts with President Gela. He encouraged the USG to speak frankly with Djibouti about the risks of its behavior. 
The Edda maintained that the god was on the wrong path and added that Djibouti was not strong enough to take Ethiopia's continued friendship and forbearance for granted. But in February, March 2008, a putative Eritrea Djibouti border dispute was deliberately escalated to advance US Ethiopia agenda against the state of Eritrea. The government of Djibouti unleashed an intensive campaign accusing Eritrea of deploying forward troops in the common border. On May 12, 2008, France's position on the issue remained the same. A cable from the US Embassy in Paris reported the following. Legal said the Djiboutians had been phoning her three times a day and that her message to them was to avoid raising tensions in the region over an incident that had resolved itself peacefully. She repeated that while Ethiopia's border dispute, dispute with Eritrea was long standing, there appeared to be no historical basis for a border dispute between Eritrea and Djibouti, which was another reason that both sides should avoid turning this episode into a real problem. But while France offered to mediate between Djibouti and Eritrea to resolve the issue, the United States took Djibouti's side from the very first instance. And when Djibouti forces attacked Eritrean units on June 10, 2008, the U.S. promptly condemned what it termed Eritrean aggression and pushed the UNSC to pass a resolution against Eritrea. U.S. primary role in UNSC resolutions 1907 and 2023. The United States was and remains the principal architect behind the punitive sanctions that the UN Security Council has imposed against Eritrea in 2009 and 2011, respectively. In the words of Jendai Fraser, the former Assistant Secretary of State for Africa, the strategy pursued by the US administration was to pin down and punish Eritrea for refusing to give up the legal course. The, this fact is illustrated by, among other evidence, WikiLeaks cables that are now in the public domain. According to these cables, Ambassador Susan Rice was personally involved in the push for sanctions against Eritrea under the ruse of Eritrea's conduct of regional destabilization. According to these cables, Ambassador Susan Rice was personally involved in the push for sanctions against Eritrea under the ruse of Eritrea's conduct of regional destabilization. Rice was not interested in providing evidence to support her allegations against Eritrea and her remarks about the members of the UN Security Council show that she was willing to deceive the Council to advance her agenda. Rice reminded Museveni that past experience suggested that the UNSC would not block a resolution led by African members and supported by the African Union. The U.S. State Department has been obsessed, especially in the last 10 years, with demonizing Eritrea and its government. The annual Human Rights Report is invariably replete with gross distortion of facts and events. The U.S. State Department put Eritrea as a country of particular concern on religious freedom purely for political reasons. Eritrea is a secular state where all religions are respected and where Christianity and Islam have coexisted in harmony for over 1400 years. The trumped up charge of religious persecution is being vigorously pursued for other ulterior motives. In reality, the regulatory monitoring pertains to few fringe groups whose membership does not exceed a couple of hundreds and who receive financing from abroad. These groups were asked to register in, in accordance with the laws of the country and to declare their income, but they have and continue to routinely defy these regulations. The charge of regional destabilization is equally preposterous. Ethiopia has invaded Somalia in violation of UN Security Council resolutions, which were adjusted to fit the new reality because of US support. Ethiopia's invasion of Somalia was long planned with the tacit encouragement and joint planning of the respective US agencies. Ethiopia is violating international law to occupy sovereign Eritrean territories and to spawn a permanent situation of regional tension and instability. The United States has been feverishly working, especially in the last five years, to isolate Eritrea and to undermine the flow, investment, and economic cooperation from Europe and the Middle East in particular. 
For example, in his conversation with Mela Zanawi in Ethiopia on 19 November 2009, U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Carl Wyckoff, divulges U.S. campaign to isolate Eritrea. Wyckoff agreed there is no evidence that Eritrea has showed improvement in its behavior, although he added that President Isaias has recently undertaken something of a charm offensive targeted at European diplomats, a possible indication that he may be considering options. Wyckoff assured Mellis that the U.S. remains committed to achieving a UNSC sanctions regime against Asmara and continues to broaden the discussion beyond the P3 and Uganda with a hard push by Yusun. He said the USG was also expanding efforts to undercut support for Asmara, noting, for example, that he has been sent on a trip to Cairo, Riyadh, Jeddah, and other cities, both to promote the efforts to undercut flows of support to Asmara, but also to seek concrete support for Somalia's TFG. He said he has observed that some EU member states, formerly more supportive of Eritrea, have come to accept that Eritrea is playing a seriously negative role in the region and that the UK now believes that Eritrea has become a significant threat to its own domestic security. The profound antipathy that characterizes the United States Eritrean ties does not emanate, as is often insinuated, from recent differences on the war in Somalia. It predates this singular event. Indeed, since the 1950s, when overriding U.S. strategic interests compromised Eritrea's right of decolonization, successive U.S. administrations have invariably propped up Ethiopian colonial presence in Eritrea. The spiral of hostility that characterizes U.S. policy towards Eritrea boils down to one overriding reason. This was true in the 1950s and it's also true today. It has nothing to do with principles of international law or with values of justice, democracy, and human rights. The United States has all along believed that its perceived strategies in the region can be better served by Ethiopia. Irrespective of the philosophical persuasions of the regime in power in Addis Ababa, this consistent and overriding policy was couched in the Cold War terms in the 1950s. It has now been articulated in terms of the regional anchor states, as spelled out in the U.S. National Security Strategy of 2002. The spiral of hostility this policy that characterizes the U.S. policy of air traffic in Ethiopia boils down the region, to one over even the United States itself. This was true in the 1950s, and it's also to true to what has transpired in the It has nothing half to do with the last principles of international it's law or with values of justice, democracy, and human rights. The United States has all along believed that its perceived strategies in the region can be better served by Ethiopia. Irrespective of the philosophical persuasions of the regime in power in Addis Ababa, this consistent and overriding policy was couched in the Cold War terms in the 1950s. It has now been articulated in terms of the regional anchor states, as spelled out in the U.S. National Security Strategy of 2002. This policy did not serve in the interests of Eritrea, Ethiopia, the region, and even the United States itself when we look in retrospect to what has transpired in the second half of the last century. It is unfortunate to note that the follies of the past century are not being redressed today.
نغنق سحب زهد نغ سحب زنات تفغره نمد حاجره حاجته أرد راو مرت لوم بري خلوم دوس أم الله علم نفاس بري سلوم I'm 